what I'm saying? <laughs> Glory to God. But um, last week we, we started talking about faith and we, we, we talked about how faith is the word. It is the truth that was made flesh in the birth, in the death, in the burial, in the resurrection, in the ascension of Jesus. And that's even kind of a shock. Um, because now we come and start talking about faith in terms of it being a person or in terms of it being a thing instead of it being in terms of something that we, we do. And really a more accurate way to describe faith, would we could say it like this and kind of insert it into what John said in his gospel in chapter 1. Um, in the beginning was faith, and faith was with God, and faith was God, and faith was made flesh. Okay. Um, that's how we could think about faith and start understanding faith in its proper context. So when we talk about faith, we're not talking about something that we do. And this is what we talked about last week. Faith isn't something that you do. It isn't something you can perform. It's something that happens to you. Faith isn't something you do. It's something that happens to you as you behold it in the person of Jesus. You can't do faith. You can only let faith do you. Okay? You can't perform faith. You can only let faith come and perform in you that which it's intended to do. That's what it's come to do. Faith has come to do something inside of people. And the only thing you can do is see the faith and say, ah, I make myself available for this faith to do what it came to do. You can only allow faith to do what it came to do to you. You can only agree with the faith. You can't do the faith. You can't make yourself believe. You can't try to work your faith. You can't try to serve faith. You don't serve faith. Faith serves you. Okay, and so we talked about this last week and, and set the foundation for this, and I'll keep talking about it for a couple weeks, and, and, and next week what I'll do is I'll explain what obedience is, and we'll talk about what it means to be obedient to the faith, so people can see that whole dynamic in light of faith being something that we behold instead of something that we do, and so next week we'll wrap it up with um, what it means to be obedient to the faith, and um, and that will blow everybody's minds, too. Um, because we've defined things like obedience through thinking faith is something we do. And then our whole idea of obedience can become we're commanded to do something, and now we must do it. And that has nothing to do with biblical obedience. So this week, we're going to keep talking about um, faith and um, how it works in our lives so we can, we can find that we, we're, we're actually able to enjoy the relationship with faith the way we were intended to. Um, that, that we can actually have a relationship with faith that's based on the truth, that's, that's based on the way it was designed to work in our lives. Um, because when, when we can know faith for what it is and see the way that it works in our lives, um, what happens is, is that we can find faith having its perfect work in us. When we can begin to know faith for what it is, and we can begin to see how it works in our lives. We begin having the relationship with faith we were always intended to have. And when we begin having the dance with faith that we were always intended to have, what happens is, is that through us dancing with faith, meaning that um, we're not the ones who lead, faith is the one that leads. And through us having the dance with faith we were always created to have, something beautiful happens. Faith is able to have its perfect work in us. Instead of us trying to work the faith perfectly, when we begin to see faith for what it is and how it works in our lives, man, we'll find faith having its perfect work in us. We'll find faith accomplishing in us that which it came to do. And then we can find our hearts saying, man, faith has been made perfect in us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So you want to start thinking about faith has come to do something to you. Faith came to do something to all of us. Glory to God. And that, that really changes the dynamic of what we're talking about here. But, you know, if you look at the account of Martha and Mary in the Bible, um, Martha was busy working when Jesus came for his visit. When Jesus was visiting with Mary and Martha, Martha was busy working. But what happened when you look at Mary is that Mary was uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus when he came, Mary was resting at Jesus' feet when he came for a visit. So you have Martha, when Jesus is visiting, working. And you have Mary, when Jesus is visiting, resting at his feet. Okay? Now, it was the same Jesus, guys, that was in the midst of the both of them. 
It wasn't a different Jesus that manifested himself to Martha than the Jesus that manifested himself to Mary. It was the same Jesus that manifested himself to both people. Now, what happened is the way Martha was relating to Jesus caused her to think that she must work for him. It caused her to think that she must serve Jesus. So the same Jesus is in the midst of them, visiting with them, fellowshipping with them. And the way Martha is relating to Jesus is causing her to think that she's got to work for Jesus. She's got to serve Jesus. That she's there to do something for Jesus. And then we see the way Mary is relating to Jesus is a completely different way. The way Mary is relating to Jesus is is causing Mary to think, I must now rest and sit at the feet of this guy and let this guy serve me. Same Jesus, completely different mindset about the relationship or the way that you relate to this Jesus that came and visited them and sat in the midst of them. So Mary, when the way she had a relationship with Jesus or the way she related to Jesus caused her to think, well, man, in light of this guy coming to our house, there's one thing that I must do. I must now rest and sit at his feet and let him serve me. You see? And Martha thought, no, no, no. In light of this guy coming to this house, and in light of this guy being in the midst of me, I must now serve him. I must now work for him. Completely different mindset. Now, what we want to see in this dynamic, guys, is that Jesus is faith made flesh. Jesus is faith made flesh. He is faith in the flesh. Okay? So, in this account with Mary and Martha, we could say in the account, we could say Martha is trying to relate to faith as if it is something she must do, as if it is something that she must serve, as if it is something that needs to be performed and worked. So Mary is, Martha's having a relationship with faith. When faith came to their house, when faith showed up, the way Martha thought about faith caused her to think and relate to faith as if faith was something she must do. She must serve faith. She must perform faith. And we see Martha, or Mary, she's thinking something completely different. And she's relating to faith in a completely different way. Mary relates to faith as if it was something that has come to serve her. Mary is relating to faith as if it is something that will work her. Mary sees something in faith that causes her to think that faith will perform a work on her behalf. And so if faith has come to now perform a work on my behalf, what else is there to do besides sit down and rest? And watch this faith do what it does. (laughs) I mean, you can become excited. It's like you're watching a show. Look at... You start watching the faith do what it does. Man, so many times faith is doing things to our heart. We don't even know what it's doing. And then afterwards, we get the memo because we find ourselves way over here and we see that something's happened in us. We have no idea how it's happened. And then we see, my goodness, man, faith did that inside of me. Faith performed a work in me. And now that I see that faith has done something to me, I can't boast in my own faith. But what I cannot boast in is the faith that's been from the beginning that's come from God. Hallelujah. How do you boast in faith? You acknowledge that faith works you when you don't work faith. And then you sit down at the feet of faith and you behold faith and you allow faith to be born in you. Hallelujah. See, That's what Mary was doing. Mary had a revelation. So the way Mary, and this could help all of us guys in our relationship with faith. If the way you relate to faith fills you with laboring and toiling, fills you with annoyances, makes you think it's something you must work, something you must perform, something that you do in order to get things from God, something that you do in order to be blessed by God or to get God to manifest in your life, your idea of faith will fill you with laboring and toiling and annoyances. Because every time you think you've worked faith the right way, if you don't think you see the manifestation of the faith that you worked, you become annoyed. Don't you? Listen, I know, man, because when I was busy working faith, when I was training for the Olympics and I got this horrible stress fracture in my foot, I began working faith. I began relating to faith as if I served faith, as if I could perform faith. And I was trying to get faith, my faith, to manifest some healing in my foot. I was laboring and toiling. I was confessing many times, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. Man, listen, I confessed that thing like a hundred million times. Do you know how many times you can say in your heart, by his stripes I am healed when you're busy on a 30-mile run? (laughs) 
Listen, I didn't have one 30-mile run a week. I had a 30-mile run every day. You know how many times I could confess in my heart, by his stripes I am healed? You see, I was working faith. I was trying to perform faith. I was laboring and toiling with faith. I was relating to faith like Martha, and I became filled with annoyances. Martha was very annoyed when she didn't see Mary working some faith. You see, and for me, I became annoyed with God. And if you notice, Martha also then became annoyed with God. Because God had manifested himself in his word in the flesh in Jesus. She didn't just stop. I'm sure she tried to get Mary to do something before she went and got aggravated with God. But then when she saw her working faith didn't work, she went and got aggravated with God. That's how I was with God when I, I worked faith and I thought faith was something that I do instead of something that happens to me. And when I didn't see my foot healed, listen, man, I became annoyed with God and I became like Martha. I went up to God and said, what's wrong with you? Don't you see all my laboring and toiling? Don't you see everything I've done? How can you just sit there? You see how that works, guys? Glory to God. So the, the way Mary relates to faith, guys, it brings forth rest in her heart, and it causes her to sit at the feet of faith and hear. The way Martha relates to faith fills her with laboring and toiling and annoyances, okay? And listen, we were designed to interact with faith in a certain way. We were designed to have a certain interaction with faith, and then through that interaction with faith, faith would perform a work in us on our behalf. That's the way it was designed to work. Paul said something profound in Romans 10 when he said, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word that is Christ. And so what he basically says is, listen, guys, you don't do faith. Faith does you. And the way faith comes to you and manifests in you, the way faith happens to you is by you sitting and hearing this faith. And this faith that I'm talking about that will come to you, it is the word that is Christ. Glory to God. And so when Paul uh, breaks that down, man, he's describing something dynamic. And he's explaining faith is designed to be born in our hearts. And the way that it is born in our hearts, the way that faith is born in our hearts is through us beholding faith in the person of Jesus. From us, stop looking at faith like it's a verb and start looking at faith as if it's a person, place, or thing. It's a Jesus. It's a person. It's a truth. It's a thing. And so we want to start looking at faith that way. So the way that faith can be born in us is us by beholding faith in the person of Jesus. The way faith is able to be born in our hearts is through us seeing faith as something we behold in Jesus. And as we behold that faith in Jesus, that faith will serve us. That's how faith will happen to you. That's how faith is designed to be born in our hearts. Glory to God. So what happens is when we see faith, just like Mary, when we see faith as something that serves us, as we behold it. When that's our idea about faith, it has a, an effect in us. It causes us to go to rest and sit at the feet of Jesus. When we see faith as something that serves us like Mary, instead of seeing faith as something we do like Martha, it has an effect on us where it causes us to be quiet. Everybody hears all the scriptures, be still and know that I am God. See, when you can see faith as something that happens to you, it brings a stillness to you. And it causes you, oh, Oh, okay. And then you sit down, and as you sit down and rest at the, at the feet of Jesus, faith is then able to have its perfect work in you. You see how that works? Glory to God. But what happens is, guys, if we see faith as something we, we perform or something that we do or something that we must serve, we become like Martha, and we never sit at the feet of faith long enough for faith to have its full effect in our lives in this world. You see, we never sit down long enough and behold faith to let faith do what it does. We end up becoming impatient because we end up thinking that faith isn't working. We must now work the faith. We end up thinking that faith isn't having its full effect. We now need to add our contribution to faith in order to get it to work. No, no, no. We just sit at the feet of faith and behold it. But if we don't ever sit long enough, guys, 
to let faith do what it came to do. It can be very difficult for us to see faith having its full effect in our lives in this world. Glory to God. And yes, we can rejoice that faith will have its perfect work in us, whether we realize faith isn't something we do or something, um, uh, and that it's something that we behold. We can rejoice if we have the Spirit of God in us, that if we can ever figure that out in the world to come, that faith will manifest the glory and immortality of God in us when Jesus returns. We can rejoice in that. But let us also find faith having its perfect work in us while we're in this world. Glory to God. You see what I'm saying? Let us enjoy the first fruit of this faith that has come now. Let us not just think, well, I'll suffer all my life in this world and then one day I'll be happy. No, no. Let us find faith having its full effect in our lives now. Meaning this faith will come. It will persuade you of a truth. And as this truth dwells in your heart, you'll find this faith giving birth to a love, a joy, a kindness, a meekness, a long suffering, a faithfulness that has overcome this world. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So if I'm designed to sit and hear faith, and through the hearing of faith, I find faith doing something to me, and then I try to relate to faith as if it was something I perform or something I do, it will be very difficult for me to find faith having its full effect in my life in this world. It'll, it, it just will be. If, if I'm designed to sit, and then through sitting, faith does something to me, and I'm all the time up and down, up and down, up and here, up and here. You know what's going to happen is it'll be very difficult for this faith to have its perfect work in me. It's like um, if, if I see a car and I don't know what the car is and the purpose of the car. I can see a car sitting there and I don't know what the purpose of the car is. Maybe I'm like a caveman or something, you know, and I've been flash forward to the future and I see this car and I see that this car has wheels on it, Right. But if I don't know the purpose of this car and how this car works, I'm going to try to relate to this car in a way that isn't consistent with the relationship I'm intended to have with this car. So I may see that this car has wheels on it, and I may think, I must now push this car. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? And now I'm busy, even though I'm having a relationship with the car, I'm not having the relationship with the car I was created to have because I don't know that I'm actually designed to go sit in the car and the car powers itself and pushes itself. So all I see is I see the car. I don't know what it really is. I don't really know how it works. And so instead of sitting in the car and letting the car power itself and move itself, I go run behind the car and I'm trying to push the car because after all, I see it has wheels. Now, I'm still having a relationship with the car. I'm just... the, the. I'm just not enjoying the full effect of the relationship that I could have with that car. Do you see what I'm saying? Such as it has been with faith in our lives. We've still been having a relationship with it. It's just we've been like the guy who doesn't know what it is, and so we're trying to push it. We see faith has wheels. We see this thing can go somewhere, and then we think we must push it. Instead of realizing, now we just sit, and it pushes us. Glory to God. It's, I think I mentioned it, I think I said this in the Bible study, but it's like when I was in high school, they had a dance team. And every week, the girls had to learn a new dance. And um, to perform either at the basketball games at halftime or at the uh, football games. And so every week, they had to learn a new dance. Now, when the girls would come into the gymnasium or the cafeteria to learn the new dance, they didn't all just walk in there and start trying to do the dance. They didn't just all walk in and all of a sudden start trying to do the dance. Do you know what they all did? They all walked into the gymnasium. They all walked into the cafeteria and they all sat down. And then they watched somebody else do the dance while they were sitting. See, they were beholding the dance. And through them sitting at the feet of the dance and beholding the dance, the dance in the way that it worked could be born inside of them. And then they could find that dance being born in them through them beholding it and animating their life. That's the same way that it is with faith, guys. You don't come in and try to do faith. You sit at the feet of faith. And through you sitting at the feet of faith, it becomes born in you. Glory to God. You guys see how that works? Thank you, Jesus. So when understanding faith, we'll talk about this a lot, but, uh, man, I just love Abraham. Um, and I think you learn more, about Abraham, learn more about faith by looking at Abraham than you do anybody else in the Bible other than Jesus. Um, so we're going to talk a lot, a lot about Abraham 
the next two weeks when we talk about faith. And uh, so we can understand a lot about Abraham. I mean, we call Abraham the father of faith for a reason. Um, because you can see the way Abraham's relationship with faith looked, the way his relationship with faith worked, and then you could see, oh, that's the way that I'm supposed to have a relationship with faith. It works the same way with me, glory to God. And then you could find yourself be set free. Hallelujah. So those of you that like to turn in your Bibles, we're going to turn in James chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. James chapter 2. Verse 21 through 23, you don't have to turn there if you don't want. Um, I apologize, normally we'd stick them up on the thing, but um, I got lazy. I don't want to say I got lazy, but I said to myself, you know what? We don't have to have them up on the thing, so I'm just going to read them. So don't throw stones at me. Glory to God. I say it all the time, but I figure if I give everybody else grace, it's really the secret to get them to give me grace. If I don't impute your transgressions to you, then glory to God, man, you won't be imputing mine to me. Hallelujah. And then, then that's how we'll find that we can all love each other. Well, we're not all busy criticizing each other and scrutinizing each other and trying to find all of our faults and all the ways that we all get it wrong. And then we can actually find that we can just enjoy each other. Hallelujah. And I'm, my, my, my siblings are very happy to hear me say those kinds of things. Because they, they grew up in a completely different Greg. Um, they grew up with a Greg who believed life was found in perfection. And so uh, Greg was all the time scrutinizing them and all their imperfections and telling them about how it was messing everything up. <laughs> and so, the, it, see, they can testify to the grace of God because they see me and they think, hey, it's only by God that this guy could be that way. <laughs> oh, and they're, thinking, and, it, and, and they're thinking, well, God must do it this way because if he's the one who put us in bondage, then God must now come through him to set us free from the bondage he put us in. <laughs> oh, and then we could get a good laugh about it. Hallelujah. James chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. Um, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. He was called the friend of God. Hallelujah. Um, now, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time explaining justified and works. Um, I'll do that next week when I talk about obedience to faith. And I'll explain what it meant and what is the work that justified Abraham. It ain't, just real quick, it isn't the action of Abraham offering Isaac that justified him. It was what he believed in his heart. And what he believed in his heart is that he wouldn't be the father of many nations by his ability to preserve Isaac and preserve Isaac's life as his seed, but that his ability to be the father of many nations was found in God and God's ability to preserve Isaac's life in God's ability even should Isaac die for God to now conquer that death glory to God and we see the fulfillment of this in Jesus because Jesus would be the seed that would also make Abraham the father of many nations now Jesus died didn't he and so if Jesus could now be raised from the dead, Abraham could never be the father of many nations. And so Abraham had a persuasion that said, even should the promised seed die, that can't keep me from being the father of many nations, for God can raise him from the dead. Well, Jesus was the promised seed that would make Abraham the father of many nations. And he did die. And then what happened? God came and raised the promised seed from the dead, thus making Abraham the father of many nations. Glory to God. You ain't never heard that or read that in a book. I ain't never heard it that way till just now. <laughs> and so the work that Abraham did, is he believed his ability to be the father of many nations was not found in his strength to preserve Isaac. It was found in God, in his strength to preserve Isaac, that justified him. It caused him to appear as the father of many nations when God raised him from the dead. Glory to God, when God preserved Isaac's life. So the part I want to look, man, I'll get off on that now. I'm so sorry. Um, I didn't even intend to say all that. Uh, the part that I want to look at with the verse is the part that says faith was made perfect, um, where it says, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So the part we're going to highlight here is, was faith made perfect? 
faith was made per perfect. Because it isn't a question. He's making a declaration. He's saying faith was made perfect. Okay, so when we think of what it means that, was, that faith was made perfect, we want to think of it from the foundation that James is talking about that eternal faith that was with God in the beginning. Okay? When we look at this word faith, and we see James say faith was made perfect, we don't want to be thinking about Abraham's faith or our faith. This faith that James says was made perfect is that eternal faith that was in the beginning, that was with God, that was God, that was face to face with God, that was made flesh in Jesus and came to the earth. That's the faith James is talking about. So when we think about what does it mean that faith was made perfect, we want to think about it from the terms that this faith is the eternal faith, and we want to think about what is it that this eternal faith that has been from the beginning has now come to accomplish. What is it that this eternal faith that has been from the beginning has now come in the person of Jesus to accomplish in people? That's how we want to understand what it means that faith was made perfect, okay? There is a faith. That faith existed before man even existed. This faith comes to accomplish something. When this faith can accomplish what it came to do, it's made perfect. I just get happy, man, thinking about faith like this. Um, and specifically in Abraham, we'll look at first. But this faith, all, this faith also came to do something um, in the hearts of people. So when James says faith was made f perfect, he, he's saying the faith that was in the beginning with God, the faith that was with God, the faith that is God, the faith that was made flesh in Jesus, that faith came to do something to Abraham. That faith that was with God in the beginning came to accomplish something in Abraham, and that faith accomplished what it came to do in Abraham. That's what he's talking about when he says faith was made perfect. And I just want to stop and point this out to everybody. You guys notice how we're talking about Jesus kind of in a different way than maybe you've all been taught to think about Jesus. Because we've all just thought about Jesus as only being a person. We, we completely missed the aspect of John saying the word was made flesh. A truth was made flesh. A wisdom was made flesh. There was a wisdom that was revealed in the birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. That's the thing we're supposed to be busy fellowshipping with. That's the thing that has the power to animate our lives with the life of God. Glory to God. I always knew Jesus was a person. It didn't help me when I was an alcoholic drug addict. Do you know what happened? As I hung around the toilet, when I only thought of Jesus as a person, I would only cry out to Jesus, take this drug addiction from me. That didn't possess the power to save me from the drug addiction. But when I began seeing the truth that was made flesh in Jesus, when I began seeing Jesus wasn't just a person, but there was a word, a wisdom, a truth that was made flesh in him, when I began seeing that truth, that truth set me free from the drug addiction. And now I was really having a relationship with this Jesus. Glory to God. The way you really have a relationship with Jesus is by having a relationship with the word that was made flesh. The end goal is a relationship with the father through his word that was made flesh in Jesus. The only way I can have a relationship with the father that's the way I was intended to be is if I can see the word that was made flesh in Jesus telling me about the father. Amen. And then I can even see that word is the father because the father and his word can't be separate. Just like my word can't be separate from me. It's the only way you could see Jesus and see the Father. That's the only way Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because Jesus was saying, I'm the word of the Father made flesh. Imagine the Father standing here and talking. I'm that. <laughs> Glory to God. Listen, guys, yes, we can say that Abraham's belief was perfected. Yes, we can say that the belief in Abraham's heart was perfected because that is an aspect of what faith came to do to Abraham. That is part of what faith came to do to Abraham. But the focus of this verse is not on Abraham and what he did. The focus is on the faith that came to Abraham and what this faith did to him. The focus is on the faith that came to Abraham and how this faith accomplish that which it came to do to him glory to God and if we see ourselves relating to faith the way 
Abraham did, we'll find that faith accomplishing that which it came to do in us. And then we'll find ourselves saying the same thing that Paul said, Abraham said, he gave glory to God. That's why I say glory to God so much. I realize God come to do something to me apart from me and my doing. And I realize the reason he came to do something to me apart from me and my doing is because of how beautiful he thinks I am to him. And when I see that, all I can say is glory to God. And I no longer consider myself in my own works or my own ability or my own doing. I no longer know myself according to the flesh, but I only know myself according to the word that came from the Father. And then all I can say at that point is glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So what happened is, when, you know, when God found Abraham, he wasn't Abraham. He was Abram. So when God found Abram, Listen, he, he saw Abram when he was Abram, and when he saw Abram, he thought, man, I see this guy Abram walking around. Abram didn't even know there was probably a God, or the, the God he thought of was some weird God because he was in the Babylonian system. His dad was probably sacrificing idols. Maybe he, he had some, maybe he heard from God partially. He didn't really understand it before that, but he was Abram. And so when God found Abram, he saw Abram, and he saw this guy, and he said, man, I like this guy Abram. I want to make this guy my friend. I want to create this guy in the image of the father of many nations. I want this guy to become the father of the faith that I'm going to send to the earth in the person of Jesus. I see this guy. Let me now make this guy my friend. Let me now cause this guy to appear as the father of many nations. This guy Abram, they call. Let me now cause him to appear as Abraham. <laughs> and so God sets out to do this. Now, listen, we know from last week, and I encourage everybody to get the CD from last week because these are all going to go together. And so you want to get it. But last week we saw that, that God creates everything through the spirit of faith. And Paul said that the Lord Jesus is the spirit of faith that God creates everything with. So in the day that God wants to make Abram his friend, in the day that God wants to create Abram in the image of the father of many nations, in the day God wants to cause Abram to appear as Abraham, he must do it through faith. He must send his faith to Abram. He must send his faith to Abram in order to cause Abram to appear as Abraham. For after all, God creates everything through the spirit of faith. He creates everything through his word. His word is his faith. Glory to God. You guys following that? So he can only make Abram Abraham. He can only make Abram his friend through this faith that has been from the beginning. So we, we, most people can just agree real simply that God creates everything with his word. We can all agree with that, right? I don't have to explain all those doctrines. So God creates everything with his word. His word is his faith. The Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks out of the heart the mouth speaks okay the heart is the faith of someone it is the wisdom they have god has a faith he has a wisdom in himself that is life and it is light in the day that god wanted to create life in the earth he declared his faith he declared his wisdom. And as Gwen, as, as Gwen said so beautifully in the Bible study, in the day that God wanted to create life in the earth, in the day he wanted to create, he declared himself. He declared himself. In Genesis, that's what God did, is he declared himself. And who he is, is life. And the Bible says in John 1, in him is life. In that life was the light of the world. So in God was life. In him was a wisdom, a truth, a word, a faith that is life. And in the day he wanted to create life in the earth, he released that faith. He declared that faith. He declared that life in order that that life could manifest light. And then that light could create the earth. That light could bring forth life in the earth. That life could bring forth or create or give the earth the face of the deep shape and form. Glory to God. <laughs> you can go back and read it, but in verse 3, God didn't create light. He didn't create the sun and the moon and the stars till uh, the fourth day, I believe. So when God said, let there be light, he didn't create light. He released 
the life that is in himself, that life is light. The only way we could say God created light in verse 3 there, and that's what that means, is if we say God created himself. You see the circuitous uh, thinking there. That'll leave you like a dog chasing your tail. God created himself. That'll leave you like this. Mm. <laughs> like, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> You'll become lost and confused. Go read it for yourself, man. It's completely different when it says, and God said, let there be light. God gave utterance to the word he has in himself. He has a belief in his heart, and when out of his mouth he spoke his belief, that belief is faith. That faith, in that faith is life. In that faith is light. And when it is released upon the face of something, it takes what doesn't have shape and form, and it gives it shape and form. It takes something that is not and makes it into what is released into it. There was no life in the face of the deep, it says. But then he released what was inside of him, and what's inside of him is life, and it moved across the face of the deep, and it gave the whole earth shape and form by bringing forth life in it. Glory to God. So, in the same way, if God wants to make Abram his friend and create Abram in the image of the father of many nations, he must do it through faith. He must do it by sending his faith to Abram to create Abram in the image and likeness of God. Now, the Bible says that the earth was without faith, uh, shape and form, and it was in chaos and darkness. When Abram was Abram and not Abraham, Abram was without shape and form. He was in darkness. He didn't have a seed. He was barren. He didn't have an heir. He didn't have life. He couldn't have life. Sarah's womb was barren. He had nothing. He was without shape and form. And just like in Genesis, when God had to release his faith into the earth to create life in the earth, God also had to release his faith to Abram in order to give Abram shape and form, in order to create Abram in the image of the father of many nations, in order to bring forth life in Abram, in order to make Abram exceedingly fruitful, in order to combat the deadness of Sarah's womb. God had to release his faith. Glory to God. God believed something in his heart about Abraham. Out of his heart, his mouth spoke. <laughs> and what came out of his mouth is what he believed about Abram. It is his faith. And when that faith came to Abram, then that faith could create Abram in the image of what the father believed about Abram. You see how that works? Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so, listen, God believed something in his heart about Abraham. His belief was that Abram is the father of many nations and that Abram's ability to appear as the father of many nations is not of himself or his doing, but it is of God and his doing. If God wants to accomplish his desire for Abram to be his friend and for Abram to appear as the father of many nations, he must send his faith to perform a work in Abram. Okay? He must send his faith to perform a work in Abram. That's the only way it can happen. Just like the only way life could manifest in the earth is by him releasing his faith, the spirit of faith. The Lord is that spirit, the Lord Jesus. The only way Abram could appear as a father of many nations, if God could release his faith, that spirit of faith, that is the Lord Jesus, and that faith could come to Abram. And so now we're busy thinking, well, when did faith come to Abram? When did this happen? Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, I've already used up almost the whole time, man. I'm not even halfway finished. My goodness. When did faith come to Abraham? When did faith come to Abram? When did this thing go down that you speak about, Greg? It can't be. When did this happen? Genesis chapter 17. And I loved what Gwen said. It was so beautiful. I've asked many people that question, and I've never heard someone say it as beautifully as her when she said he declared himself. Because I, I ask everybody, you think God created the light in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3? You think that light he created? <laughs> I said, how can that be? Well, well Gwen, man, she, by the Spirit of God, I told her flesh and blood didn't reveal that to her. She says he declared himself. <laughs> I said, you got that right, lady. In him is life, and if he declares himself, that's what will make life manifest. But Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. 
It says that when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. He declared himself. <laughs> I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make, thee, make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Notice how God is telling Abram all the time what he will do? I, 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 I. Is there any part in there that says what Abram's going to do? Nope. So God, Abram, had heard that he would be the father of many nations, I think, in chapter 15. Well, he thought that meant he would have to do it himself. And so he went and had an Ishmael. But you can't be the father of many nations through Ishmael because you can't be the father of many nations through the flesh. You can only be the father of the people that would come after that flesh. Abraham wasn't going to only be the father of the Jewish people. He was going to be the father of every nation that would be on the faith that would come later in the person of Jesus. The same faith that came to him in chapter 17. And so God comes, faith came to Abraham, Abram in chapter 17 where God comes and reveals himself. I am the almighty God. What that means is God came and said, I am El Shaddai. What that means is I am the all-sufficient one. Your ability to appear as the father of many nations is not of you and your strength, but it is of me and my grace and my strength. So, walk in my work and find yourself appearing as the father of many nations. That's what it means when God said, walk before me and be thou perfect. What would make Abram perfect is if he could appear as who and what God called him. The only way he could appear as who and what God called him is if he allowed the faith that came to him to create him in the image that the Father had of him in his heart. Glory to God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Notice it says, and Abraham fell on his face. Even in the Jewish culture, when you keep going like that, a sign of repentance many times can be you would fall on your face. You would mourn. Mourning, that word mourn. We think of mourning only as, oh, but mourning could also be known as repentance, where you could see you had gotten it wrong, and then you would fall on your face before someone and see, I repent from my old way of thinking, and now I think like this with you. See, Abram thought he would be the father of many nations through his own ability. That's why he went and got a concubine, because Sarah's womb was dead, and he had an Ishmael. And then when God comes and says, no, 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 buddy. You're not going to be the father of many nations through your own ability. It's going to be through me. I'm the all-sufficient one. I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And this is a great question for everybody to ask themselves. How could a guy who was going to be the father of the Jewish culture also be the father of many nations? How can that be? <laughs> Can't be if it's only according to the flesh. It has to be according to the spirit of promise. So Abraham fell on his face acknowledging, yeah, man, it's by you. It ain't going to be by me. Glory to God. So faith came to Abram in Genesis 17 to make him the friend of God, to justify him by causing him to appear as the father of many nations, by creating him in the image of the father of faith. Faith came to Abraham in Genesis 17. Faith came. Faith came. To Abram in Genesis 17 to persuade him of what God was persuaded of about him. Faith came to Abraham to persuade him not to consider the deadness of his body or the deadness of Sarah's womb when judging whether he would be the father of many nations or not, but to consider the ability of the one who promised, the one who came and declared himself as the all-sufficient one. Faith came and washed Abraham's conscience clean from the knowledge of good and evil. It washed Abraham's conscience clean from considering himself and what he saw in his flesh, what he saw in Sarah's flesh, and what he saw in their external circumstances when he judged whether he would be the father of many nations and exceedingly fruitful or not. It washed his conscience clean from considering his flesh. The knowledge of good and evil. Well, this guy says I'm going to be the father of many nations. He first considered Sarah. He said, well, how can that be? She's barren. 
He was considering his flesh. Faith came, washed his conscience clean from considering his own deadness in the deadness of Sarah's womb, and it caused him to consider something else. The thing he considered instead was the power of the living God, the spirit of the living God, the grace of the living God. And that's why Abram was changed to Abraham. Grace came through faith and animated Abram with grace, and then Abram became Abraham. Glory to God. So faith washed his conscience clean, man, from considering his own ability when thinking of how he could be exceedingly fruitful in the father of many nations. And it caused him to look to God instead. It caused him to look to God and God's grace and strength when judging how is it going to be that I'm going to be the father of many nations. Faith came and gave Abraham a different place to reason from. It gave him a different place to reason from than the place he was reasoning from. Notice how God waited. I think he waited like 17 years, 13 years between the time um, uh, he first come to Abram and told him to be the father of many nations. Because Sarah's womb was dead, but clearly Abraham still had some life in his flesh. And so God said, all right. God said, look, Abram was like me. He, he just can't get it. God said, well, let this guy come, become completely dead in his flesh also. Then I'll come and promise him. Because so, then he'll realize he can't do it himself. He will realize, no, dude, I never meant for you to do that. I meant for you to do this instead. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so faith came and gave Abraham a different place to reason from when he judged who he was and whether he would be exceedingly fruitful or not. And through all that that I just described, guys, faith was made perfect in Abraham. Faith accomplished that which it came to do to Abraham by justifying him and causing him to appear as the father of many nations. Faith came to justify Abraham. How could Abraham be justified? The only way he could be justified is if he appeared as who and what God called him. The only way he could appear as the father of many nations is if he believed on God and his grace and strength. Glory to God. It's the only way. Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through 21. Listen, guys, I have this kind of my own knowledge of good and evil that works sometimes, and I feel that I have to get through the whole thing in order for it to hit. But um, I'm just going to have to believe that through the Spirit, I'll get through as much as I can. And if I don't finish it out, man, you guys will just have to trust God. <laughs> Romans, because this stuff's too good for me just to skip over it. Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through 21, we'll take a look at this. Romans, th everything I just described, Paul comes and expounds on. He comes and expounds on chapter, Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through 21. Now listen, you can't understand the writings of Paul if you're busy thinking faith is something you do in all of his letters. You can only understand what he's saying if you realize faith is the way I've been describing it the last two weeks. Ninety-something percent of the time Paul talks about faith. He's talking about faith as a thing, not as something you do. Okay? And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. This is what Paul comes and talks about, the father of faith. Now remember, when it, I think I said this before, but when, when it says Abraham gave glory to God, it means Abraham acknowledged that it would be by God and his doing alone that Abraham would be the father of many nations and exceedingly fruitful. You see, before, we only think of glory to God like um, a cliche, like you guys hear me say glory to God and you think it's just a slogan. You know, it, it, listen, when I say glory to God, it isn't a slogan. When I say glory to God, it's because I'm in awe of God and his doing, and I'm acknowledging that every good thing can only come through him and his doing. Okay, so it's like we, if we look at the life of Abraham, when he thought he could be the father of many nations by laying with the concubine, he was giving glory to the flesh. You see, it? he was glorying in the flesh. He was saying, I will be the father of many nations through my own strength. But now when it says he's fully persuaded that God was able to do to him what God promised, now it says he gave glory to God. He acknowledged that he would only be the father of many nations by God in his doing. Hallelujah, okay? Now, we're going to look at this phrase up in here, and I encourage everybody who likes to study the Bible, go study this. The phrase we're going to look at is strong in faith. It says Abraham was strong in faith. 
Now, from the interpretation where we think of faith as something that we do, that sounds a lot different than if we think of faith as something that does us, isn't it? Now, look what this means. This is very interesting. Strong in faith does not speak of a person's strength in a certain area. Does not speak of a person's strength in a certain area. When you look up that word uh, in the Greek, it speaks of someone being endued with strength from something. It speaks of someone receiving strength from something. It speaks of someone being strengthened by something else. So it speaks of a guy who doesn't have any strength and then something coming to him and enduing him with strength. You see what I'm saying? Glory to God. We can say it like this. So this is a great example we can use this for. Um, we could say it like this as an example. Popeye was strong in spinach. I'm going to say that again. Abraham was strong in faith. Popeye was strong in spinach. Okay? Popeye was strong in spinach. Now, this doesn't mean that Popeye was really good at spinach. Do you see what I'm saying? When we read Abraham was strong in faith, we, we got this idea that means Abraham was really good at faith. But he really worked that faith. He had that faith, and he was, he got that thing chugging along, man. He was like the little engine that could. I can, I can, I can. I know I can, I know I can, I know I can. I hope I can, I hope I can. I can't, God. <laughs> Abraham, yeah, maybe he's like the little engine that could at first, and then he realized he can't. And then he found himself weak in the flesh. And then he received strength from the spirit of the living God. He received strength from faith. So Abraham was strong in faith. Popeye was strong in spinach. It doesn't mean that Popeye was really good at spinach. It means that when Popeye would crack open the can and eat the spinach, he received strength from the spinach. He was endued with strength from the spinach, isn't it? Glory to God. It means that Popeye was strengthened by spinach. That's what Paul is trying to say. He's saying Abraham had no strength. And he received strength from the faith of God. What faith? The faith that he would be the father of many nations, not by him and his doing, but by God and his doing. Abraham received strength from the word of God. God believed something about Abraham and how Abraham could appear as the father of many nations. And then out of God's heart, his mouth spoke. He released a word. That word strengthened Abraham. When Paul said Abraham was strong in faith, he's saying Abraham received strength from the word of God about his life. Hallelujah. Just like the earth receives strength to have life through the word of God, through God's faith. It's the same way with Abraham. Hallelujah. So, man, Paul isn't talking about how powerful Abraham's faith was. He is saying that faith came to Abraham and strengthened him. He is saying Abraham received strength from the faith that came to him. The strength he received from the faith that came to him was to no longer consider the deadness of his body or the deadness of Sarah's womb when he judged whether he could be exceedingly fruitful or the father of many nations or not. How could he stop considering that unless something could come and tell him to no longer consider that? How could he now consider God and his grace and strength unless something could come to him, unless a word could come to him and tell him to consider God and his grace and strength instead of considering the deadness of his womb or the deadness of Sarah's womb and the deadness of his flesh? You see what I'm saying? He received strength from the faith that came to him in Genesis 17 to consider God and his grace instead of the flesh. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So that's what faith did to Abraham. It came and it brought forth trust in his heart towards God. And it caused his heart to be circumcised from trusting in his own ability. He received strength. You know, the only way you can appear as the father of many nations is if you're going to be the father of faith. Well, what's the faith? The faith is you can't have life through you and your own doing. So the only way Abraham could be the father of the faith is if he also believed you couldn't have life through you and your own doing. And so how could he be strengthened unto appearing as the father of many nations? As if his heart could be persuaded, not by me and my doing, O God, will I be the father of many nations, but by you and your doing. Then he could receive strength to appear. Hallelujah. So it's like, you know, the Genesis said that God called forth light out of the darkness. 
Abram was in darkness. And so the way, what God did is he called forth Abram out of darkness into the light by releasing his word, by releasing his faith, and that faith coming to Abraham. Glory to God. He called forth Abram out of the darkness into the light by calling him the father of many nations. By calling him that which it didn't look like he was. Paul said in, Ro- in Romans verse 4, 17, I think, he says that God calls those things that don't look like what they are, what they are, in order that they might receive strength to appear as what God has called them. Hallelujah. And so God called Abraham what it didn't look like he was. Abram was Abram. He was in darkness. And when God wanted to call forth Abram out of the darkness into the the light he came to Abram and he called him the father of many nations he released his word he sent his faith to Abram and he called forth Abram out of the darkness into the light by calling him the father of many nations and then Abram received strength from God's word what God believed about him to appear as who and what God called him hallelujah the father of faith you guys following that you know I might just try to finish real quick what do you guys think Don't say that, man. (laughs) All right, back to us. Now we're going to pull this thing full circle. Okay? So you guys understand that about Abraham? I tried to really hammer it in there. Um, God sees man, and he wants to be a family with them. He wants to make man his friend. He wants to make them exceedingly fruitful. He knows man as his sons and daughters, and he wants them to be able to appear as his sons and daughters and live with him face to face for all eternity in love. That's what God wants with man. In the same way he saw Abram, and he wanted Abram to be his friend, he saw man. He wanted man to be his family. He wanted man to be with him for all eternity. He wanted man to be his friend. He wanted man to appear as what he knew about man. He knew man came from him. He knew man were his sons and daughters. And he wanted man to be able to appear as who and what they were. Glory to God. He wanted them to be able to live with him in a face-to-face relationship for all eternity in love. Okay, He wanted man to have the same relationship with him that we see Jesus having with the Father. Where Jesus and the Father can stand face to face. And there's no feeling of condemnation in the heart of Jesus. When Jesus was standing face to face with the Father, he didn't find anything in him that said the Father is now scrutinizing me. The Father is now examining me to see if I'm perfect or not. The Father is now looking for faults. He didn't find that emotion in his heart at all. Glory to God. He didn't think that the Father was going to hurt him or kill him. He didn't find his heart filled with shame or fear in the presence of the Father. He found his heart filled with love when he stood face to face with the Father instead of fear. God wanted that same thing to be born in man. Because man found something else happening in them. They felt fear and shame to be face to face with God. They didn't feel love in their heart when they stood with God. They felt fear. They felt like God was scrutinizing them, looking for all their sins, looking for all their imperfections. And so man couldn't stand face to face. Man was in darkness. Man was without shape and form, just like the world was in Genesis. They were without shape and form. They were in darkness. They were in chaos. You guys following me? We were barren. We couldn't see God for who he is or the truth about his thoughts and intentions towards us. We could not see the truth about who we are. We could not see how God could overcome the death that was manifesting in us. We didn't see how God could bring forth his life in us. We didn't think we were his sons and daughters because after all, in him is life. And when we looked at ourselves, all we saw was death. So we couldn't believe what he said about us. And we couldn't believe we were his. And we couldn't believe that he wanted to be face to face with us. So God sent his faith to create us in the image of Christ Jesus. <laughs> God sent his faith, just like God sent his faith to create Ab- Abram in the image of Abraham, God wanted us to appear as his sons and daughters and stand face to face. So he sent his faith, he sent his word to create us in the image of Christ Jesus. He sent his faith to give us shape and form. He sent his faith to manifest light in the earth and to call us forth out of darkness into the glorious light of Jesus. God believed something about man and out of his heart his mouth spoke what he believed about man in the person of Jesus. And through this faith came to give man shape and form and create them in the image of Christ Jesus. Now, do you know what can happen when God can create you in the image of Christ Jesus? Face to face. You no longer feel like you're being scrutinized. You no longer feel like you're, you're not perfect. 
You no longer feel like you're not full of glory and honor. You no longer feel shame. You no longer feel naked. Jesus never felt that way in the image of the Father. Jesus wasn't ashamed to be face to face with the Father even as he hung on the cross naked with all death manifesting in him. How do we know? He didn't run and hide from God even when he found himself in the place where all death was manifesting in his body. How do you know that, Greg? Well, when he was dying on the cross and he was naked, he didn't say, I can't call out to the Father, but rather he said something else. Father, into your hands I trust my life. (laughs) Face to face, even as he saw death. He didn't find something in him that said, oh, well, the father will now abandon me because I don't have life. (laughs) Glory to God. Hallelujah. God believed something in his heart about man, and out of his heart his mouth spoke in order that all who would be persuaded by the word that he spoke could receive strength to appear as his sons and his daughters. Glory to God. Remember, guys, faith is the word or the truth that was made flesh in Jesus' birth, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, and in his ascension. So faith came in the person of Jesus to create us in the image of the Son and to make us the friends of God. God had to strengthen us in the inner man so we could have confidence in his presence, so that our hearts would not blame us, so that our hearts would not condemn us in his presence. So faith came in the person of Jesus to persuade our hearts of the beauty of God's thoughts and intentions towards us and cast out condemnation and fill us with boldness and confidence to come into the holiest place. Faith came to strengthen us in the inner man with confidence to stand in the presence of God by baptizing us with the glory and perfection we see in the resurrection of Jesus. The high priest stood in the presence of God wearing the the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, baptized in the glory and the perfection of God. That was the only way he could stand in the presence of God. Faith came in the person of Jesus to baptize you in that same glory and perfection, to clothe you with the breastplate of God's judgment in order that you could be strengthened in the inner man, to stand face to face with God and feel confidence and love instead of shame and fear. Glory to God. He came to give you shape and form. He came to create you in the image of Christ Jesus, the way that Christ Jesus looked at the Father. Hallelujah. Faith came to wash our conscience clean from sin and death and cause our hearts to be blameless before the Lord. Faith came to fill our hearts with the judgment of God about us in Jesus so we could be filled with confidence to enter the holiest place. Not just one guy who could enter the holiest place once a year. All people could enter the holiest place whenever they wanted. In fact, they could make their tabernacle in the holiest place. <laughs> That's where I'm tabernacling. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. <laughs> uh, Faith came in Jesus to bring forth trust in our hearts towards God. Faith came in Jesus to cause you to no longer consider yourself and your ability when judging how you can have life, how you can be exceedingly fruitful and appear as the sons and daughters of God, but to consider instead the one who's promised you life by revealing to you he is able to do what he has promised in the resurrection of Jesus. He doesn't just come and say, I can conquer your death and I can give you life. He comes in the person of Jesus, which is faith, to persuade you he's able to do that which he's promised. And when he can persuade you that he can do what he's promised, he brings forth trust in your heart. Faith came to bring forth trust in your heart towards God. Hallelujah. God doesn't demand that you be fruitful, guys, or that you produce good fruit. He's promised to make you fruitful. He has promised to bring forth his life, his glory, his immortality in you. Faith came in Jesus to cause you to go to rest in God's ability and what God has promised by revealing that he is able to conquer the deadness of your flesh and bring forth his life in you. When he conquered your death with his life in the body of Jesus' resurrection, faith came. (laughs) Glory to God. Faith came to, to justify you. It came to cause you to no longer consider the deadness in your flesh or the world around you when you judged whether you could be fruitful or whether you were the sons and daughters of God or not. How many of you look at the, the, the works you see manifesting in your life to determine whether or not you're acceptable to God? Whether or not you're justified? 
How many of you judge yourself that way? Faith came to wash your conscience clean from that and give you a different place to reason from about whether or not you could be fruitful and whether or not you could be the sons of God. Behold your death in the body of Jesus. Now, what do we see God come and do? Do you want to know if God can make you fruitful when you see death manifesting in your life? Behold the one who died your death. And what do you see God come and do with him? He comes and raises him up from dead unto life, and he makes that guy exceedingly fruitful in order to persuade you what he can do with you. Hallelujah. Faith came to make dead bones alive. Now listen, guys. Faith is made perfect in us by casting out condemnation and fear from our hearts and replacing that fear with the love of God. Faith is made perfect in us by causing us to know ourselves the way we've always been known by God. Faith is made perfect in us by strengthening us in the inner man with confidence in the presence of God. Faith is made perfect in us by causing our souls and our flesh to go to rest. It is made perfect in us by bringing forth trust in our hearts towards God and his ability to bring forth his fruit in us and cause us to appear as the sons and daughters of God. Faith is made perfect in us by accomplishing its goal of raising us up unto glory and immortality and causing us to appear as the sons and daughters of God, full of glory in the return of Jesus. That's how faith will ultimately be made perfect in all of us. Ultimately, face-to-face won't just be a spiritual thing in our hearts. Face-to-face will be a very real thing with the God of all glory. Where faith, its final work in our life will be, it will raise us up in the day Jesus returns by manifesting the glory and immortality of God in our physical bodies, causing us to see God in his glory and immortality and then seeing ourselves and us seeing we're the same as him. And then we don't run and hide from him like Adam did, but we sit and stand face to face and we feel the love of God and then we live eternally with God in love. Hallelujah. On a glorified and redeemed earth. Hallelujah. Just as Paul said that Abraham received strength from from faith to rest in God and his ability, just as Paul said Abraham received strength from faith to appear as the father of many nations, We receive strength from what God believes about us. We are strengthened by God's word about who and what we are. We receive strength to rest in God and his ability from the faith that came in Jesus. We receive strength from the faith that came in Jesus to appear as the sons and daughters of God. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship. He sends his faith to work us. And that faith is made perfect in us through those things. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Sorry, guys, I had to like revert back to reading. Otherwise, I never would have got finished. (sighs) Man, hopefully some of that stuff at the end made sense when I was just reading. Hopefully, but if it don't, you can go back and listen and slow it down. Thank you, Father. And for all those people that want to know, well, what's our part? Next week, I'll preach about the obedience of faith. Next week, I'll preach about the obedience of faith. And Jill and Billy, man, they gave me something and I keep forgetting it at home. Glory to God. And then they gave me another one. I got both of them at home like a, you know, like a dumb ASS. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. So next week I'll preach about the obedience of faith. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that you sent your faith into the earth, that you sent your faith to perform a good work in all of us. Thank you, Father, that your faith will not return unto you void, but your faith will accomplish that which it came to do. We just thank you, Father, for the revelation of your love for us and the revelation of faith and what it really is. I just thank you, Father, that all the hearts of people can go to rest and just sit at the faith and find faith just being born in them apart from their doing, that they can find themselves just sitting at the feet of faith and find faith being born in them. They can find themselves just faith happening to them and them not even knowing really how it happened. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Amen. If anybody wants prayer, I'll pray for you.